hey, it's you. You're here. And that makes me happy. Welcome to episode 111 of Scar Bearers. I'm Chris D.T. Gordon. As always, it's a blessing to have you here with me today. Also with me, but you can't see them, are Nate and Britton Barron working on the back end of the channel to make me look and sound as good as possible. And trust me, folks, all that takes a lot of work. So if you want them to help you with your projects, please reach out to them at Nate Barron. Well, folks, as you were watching this, we are closing in on the end of the school year. And while academics might be wrapping up, that doesn't mean the problems are. And so if your school or organization is still struggling with, you know, being able to make it through those tough choices, those tough, challenging events, please reach out to me at chrisdtgordon.com so we can start a conversation and I can share the attitude of gratitude or tag and help your young people, your young adults develop that greater sense of gratitude, positivity, and resilience so they can overcome those challenging events. Well, speak, speaking of challenging events, I have my new friend Scott McDermott here, and he has challenged many an event and have overcome them. Scott, how are you today? I'm doing really awesome. Thanks. Hey, thanks for being here. Now, besides being bald and beautiful and also a speaker, you are, in addition, a runner as well, though you take what I do and you multiply it by at least three because you are an accomplished triathlete. That's true. Yeah, I guess yeah, but accomplished. I've, I, you know, it's funny. You always compare yourself to others. I, I do okay. I love what I do. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the, that's the greatest thing of life is doing what you love, but yeah. you weren't always a triathlete. Were you? No, not at all. <laughs> so how no. did that start? Well, it's a bit of a story. Um, I spent well, the first part of my career out of high school in architecture. So I was in architecture for 13 years and I sat at a desk and deadline to deadline to deadline. I got fat and sick and stressed and was a train wreck. And I was going to all kinds of different specialists trying to figure out why I was having all these problems. Uh, I had unexplained dizziness. I had ringing in my ears. I had no energy. I had, it was just a whole mess. And I finally met a doctor that said, well, as he listened to all my stuff, he's like, well, you're under a crazy amount of stress. You eat like a garbage compactor. You never exercise. You don't get enough sleep. You drink nothing but caffeinated crap. Like you got to start taking care of yourself or you're not going to make it to 30. Oof. And I woke up, <laughs> I <laughs> joined the gym and met a guy that was a personal trainer, actually happened to be a friend of mine. And I just started training and I dropped 40 pounds of fat, put on 18 pounds of muscle and all of a sudden was in the best shape of my life. And I realized that two weeks before being an associate partner, I was at the top of the ladder on the wrong building and I quit. <laughs> I resigned and I became a trainer and I opened my own gym eventually. And I ran uh, a 15,000 square foot gym for 18 years. And it was just phenomenal to pursue my passion. And in that process, I got to a place where I wanted a new challenge because I was fit and healthy and life was good, but I, I really wanted a new challenge. And there was a local half Ironman distance triathlon in our town. And I thought, I wonder if I could finish one of those. Like I can, like I could put off drowning. Like I couldn't, yeah. I'd never, I'd never swam laps or swam open water. Like I'd gone water skiing as a kid and fallen off and, you know, treaded water till they came and got me and I could fart around in the water and stuff. Like I could, I could swim, but yeah. not well. And I thought, well, I don't know, if I got a coach, maybe I could swim better. And I can ride the crap out of a stationary bike in spin class for an hour. <laughs> I can't be much harder. I could buy a bike. And I used to run in high school before I broke my back, but my back's healed. It's better. Um, okay, that's that's a really quick. I want to say, I want to detail <laughs> for just a second. You broke your back in high school. Yeah. How did yeah. that happen? Um, I was a competitive gymnast in high school for a little while, and oh, wow. I was doing a Russian vaulting move on the, the vaulting horse. Uh, we were doing long vault, and I opened my pike too soon and over-rotated in the air. And so in my Ooh. hands, instead of pressing off the vault to spring away and, and somersault, I, I, I missed. And my rotations kept, and I landed flat on my back facing the ceiling, and I oh. cracked my back that way. I 
crushed the tops and bottoms of T12, L1, uh, L2, and cracked L1 hairline fracture diagonal, and I I bulged a disc and made a oh, mess. Wow. Yeah, yeah. That well, was. How long did that put you out for? Well, that in itself is an interesting story. All of the doctors <laughs> told me they convinced me that my glass, my back was now made out of fragile glass, and I should never do anything um, okay. because one hit and I'm paralyzed. And so I had a couple of different doctors say I'd be in a wheelchair by 40 and that I should just be really careful with my back. And so I lived in fear for a long time. And, you know, honestly, it wasn't until I was in, gosh, I was, I think it was, well, it was when the big change happened when I got back to fitness when I was 29 and I just started to build a team. I built a, a team with a chiropractor and a physiotherapist and a personal trainer. And I realized that if my core muscles were strong, they supported my spinal column and my back didn't hurt anymore. So who thought, right? So yeah. I just so, thought, so it was that fear, that fear that was instilled in you by those doctors that, that maybe led to your sedentary lifestyle. Totally. I was afraid to do anything. Because I was going to, my back was just going to quit on me and it hurt all the time. I would go golfing. I remember one time I went golfing and I jumped over, you know, the little rope at the edge of the green. The, yep. This is the path. This is the green. I jumped over the rope. It was like six inches high. And I landed on my heel for just my, my disc bulge. And I was, in, I couldn't walk for a week. Like, wow. That was my life. And I just thought, oh, I better be careful. Yeah. And then once I got fit and strong, like my back is bulletproof. Well, it's as, it's as bulletproof as a healthy spine and anybody is like, I mean, if yeah. I'm, an idiot, it's, I'm an idiot, but yeah. yeah. So now I, I do Spartan obstacle course races. I do all the things and I don't have to worry about it, but it was not until I got a strong, healthy body surrounding my skeleton mm -hmm. that my back pain went away. Okay. So yeah. we're going to get back on track with one more question though. Yeah, yeah. For those who don't know, how long is a half Ironman triathlon? Oh, okay. So, and you're in the States, so I'll yes. do my best to convert. Um, so a half Ironman triathlon is a 1.2 mile swim. Mm -hmm. uh, and then it is a 45 mile bike. I'm trying to convert yeah. here. And then a half marathon, which is 13.1 miles. Yeah. But you, you can also use kilometers. I, I'm not, a, I'm not afraid of the metric system. Sure. Yeah. It's a 1.9 K swim, 90 K bike and a 21 K run. Perfect. So, yeah. All right. And how did that go for you that first time? It was phenomenal. It was like the greatest <laughs> time of my life. I, uh, I hired a coach who taught me to swim because uh, my first swimming, I looked like I, somebody had tied a brick to my ankles and I was dragging it. I was swimming uphill, which is amazing yeah. in flat water. But uh, I learned to swim and I bought a bicycle and I started to learn how to ride outdoors. And again, because I hadn't since I was a kid and I started running again and all those kinds of things. But I made a lot of mistakes in the first year, but it didn't matter. I was, I just loved it. I did a sprint triathlon. So a little short one, mm -hmm. right. Just a short pool swim and a, and a short 10 mile bike and a short three mile run kind of thing. And I just was, I just was in love. I think it was 12th overall or something. And I was like, oh, wow, this is my sport. And I, then I did a, an Olympic or a standard distance, which is just a little bit longer. And then I did the half Ironman that summer and I was eighth in my age group and I was 20 something overall. And I got a roll down spot for Ironman Canada, the full Ironman five weeks later. Oh, wow. And I remember saying to my coach, I'm like, coach, do you think I could do it? And he's like, you know, I think we can get you across that finish line. Um, as long as you don't attach to the time. I'm like, nope, I just want to finish. So we yeah. doubled all of my distances and pushed me right up to a 2.4 mile swim, 112 mile bike and, um, and a full marathon, 52 miles. So, and I'd never run a marathon before, so I did it after a little bike and a swim. No, so, yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. why not? You, you're already refreshed. Yeah. Might, as, yeah. might as well go do it. So yeah. uh, really quick. I always struggle at the swim. I my my best sprint triathlon finish was the triathlon where I could basically run on the run on the beach. Right. It's like there, you, the water is like four feet deep. I just ran and then got on the bike. So yeah. what you know? Did you stick primarily to the front crawl, or did you switch it up and go maybe breath, breath uh, you know, a breaststroke for a little bit? What did you do? I just learned to front crawl the whole thing. And okay. Then, yeah. Swimming was not it was, to this day. Swimming isn't my strength. Cycling mm -hmm. is definitely my strength and I'm an okay runner. Um, but uh, yeah, swimming I'm with you there. I also discovered uh, during my first open water swim in 2005, that first race season year, that the fact that I'm prone to motion sickness really translates to the water when you're swimming. And so oh, I would throw up while I swam. Oh, sometimes. Oh, oh. It's chumming so, the water. Yeah. So I had to take gravel. 
like diamond hydronate to, uh, or, you know, various different things. I tried the C bands on your wrist. I've tried a bunch of different things to get through the, the motion sickness thing. Cause it's mm. a bit of a problem. Wow. Well, uh, yeah, you, it's, you should probably figure that out. Um, yeah, <laughs> I think so, you're there, but it's an interesting game. Yeah. Yeah. So you get up to the full, the full Ironman Canada and, you know, take us through that real quick. If you could, if you mind. Sure. Uh, it was amazing. It was just this huge experience. And back in 2004 or five, things were so much different than they are now, but just this huge event, you know, 2,800 athletes and, and the city of Penticton in Canada was just alive with a buzz. And I was just so excited and so nervous. So when the cannon goes off and nearly 3000 athletes hit the water all at once, it's just, it's like swimming upstream with, with salmon. And it's just crazy. Yeah. But I remember being on the bike course going up yellow Lake, which is a big, long 21 K climbs, about a 13 mile climb. Yeah. And it's hot. It's, you know, kind of close to 30 above. And, but I started to realize doing the math, I'm like, Oh my God, I, I'm going to finish this. Like I, I, I can do this. And I, for the first time in my life, I was proud of myself. And it really, was, it, it took yeah. going and being halfway through an Ironman triathlon. You decided, Oh, I'm proud of myself now. Yeah. You know, I mean, my life was, uh, it, it's been interesting. Um, you know, we all have our background and our story and, and I love my parents and everything, but they struggled with the problems that they had. And, um, childhood was a thing I survived and, um, a lot of scar tissue talking about scar tissue mentally, where for most of my life, I was convinced that I'm a loser. Nobody likes me. Everybody hates you. You're not good enough. You have no value. You should just shut up and go away. And so that was my outlook on the world for a long time. And there in that race, I realized for the first time that maybe I am good enough and that I did this. Mm -hmm. I did this. Yeah, and, that, and that is one of the beautiful things about racing, whether it's running or cycling is that, or swimming even, that it's you. It's you. You know, you can, you can have the best shoes, you can have the best bike, you can have the, the best wetsuit, but it is you making that happen. And I, I, you know, while I feel sad that you had lived that experience of, you know, not feeling good enough, I love that you felt that self-acceptance mm -hmm. at that time in the race when you, you probably needed it because, you know, when it's 30, 30 degrees Celsius, that's around 80, above 80 degrees Fahrenheit. That's warm and you need all the encouragement you can get. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, and okay. you're right. That's the beautiful thing about sports like that is it, it's you. You Thank got you. yourself there. Nobody else did all the swim training. Nobody else did all the cycling training. Nobody else did all the running. All the mornings up at 5 a.m. to get the run done before work or, or doing it at, you know, at 10 o'clock at night after you're kids in bed like nobody else did that i did that i was of course i didn't have children back then but anyway um yeah that was a that was a big pivotal piece in my life and it was interesting because there was still a part of my psyche that was trying to prove to my family that i was good enough like like oh they'll see this and now they'll now they'll know now i'm good enough because i've done an iron man and they didn't actually notice <laughs> they didn't I didn't get it. And that's okay. Right, yeah. It's not on the radar, you know? No, that's a whole nother development where it, it yeah, became yeah. good enough for me and it had nothing to do with them. But that first Ironman, I just was holy cow hook, line and sinker into, I just love triathlon. And so uh, I did another one and did another one. And then in 2008, I qualified to be on team Canada for the world championships in Holland for the long wow. course championships. And so I went to Holland and that was an incredible experience. And the next year I qualified again, I went to Australia for the world championships for the long course. And again, another incredible experience. And you know, that meant racing around the world and stuff in different places. I've raced in Miami and New Orleans and a um, couple of places in the States, um, around Canada, lots of different places. And that was really great. And then in 2010, I was uh, preparing for my fourth Ironman branded race. And I had lunch with a man named Nick Mallet, who's an Australian. Mm -hmm. I was having lunch with another friend of mine, Cheryl, but I was staying at her and her husband's house, you know, using one of the rooms, getting ready for, for Iron Man. And they were having lunch with Nick. And uh, we were having a chat and, and we were talking it up and he was talking about different things and listened to, to how I race and what I feel about the sport stuff. And he's like, oh, mate, you go to give Ultraman a try. And I won't wreck his accent anymore, but I was like, <laughs> shut up. 
Those guys it's are not bad. Nuts. Well, it's, and for a Canadian, it's okay, I guess. If you're Australian, yeah. you're like, oh, don't do that, right? Yeah, um, yeah. yeah. So I was like, shut up. Those guys are nuts. And like Ultraman is just insane. And so what is Ultraman besides a Japanese hero? Right. Yeah. Ultra, that's a different Ultraman. Yeah. Um, so Ultraman is in in uh, in metric is a 10 kilometer swim, 426 kilometer bike, and 84 and a half k double marathon. So it's a six mile swim. Oh, what's the distance on the run? No, I don't have it in my shirt. Um, what would you say for the how many k's? It's 426. So 426. So 426. That 1. is 6. about 250. 250. 250 266. 266. 266. Okay. 266 mile bike. And a 52 mile run, and it's done over three days. So, oh, wow, okay, yeah. Um, because so day one, you do the swim and part of the bike, and then the next day, you do the lion's share of the bike, and the third day, you do the double marathon now that you're warmed up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right? and then you get the real work. So, then, yeah, and all I remember right, things, so well, wow. I, yeah, I said to I said to Nick, I'm like, that's just stupid. And he goes, Yeah, but think about it. He's like, You're a pretty good swimmer, like you're you're w- once you get swimming, you could swim for a long time. Like if a kayak followed you and fed you electrolytes, you could keep swimming. I'm like, well, yeah. He says, and you're a really strong cyclist. Uh, so 145k is no problem, you know, 95 mile bike is no problem. And then day two, the 276k bike, the 190 mile bike, you can do that. I said, it's 12 hours. It's a, it's tight, but I could do that because it covers a couple of mountain ranges and it's hot and all these things. Mm-hmm. And I was like, but dude, the double marathon, I mean, come on, running is so hard after all that stuff. And he goes, yeah, but think about it. You can run a 320 marathon. So if you slowed it down to four hours and did an easy first marathon, you could even take a little break. You got seven and a half hours. You can walk a marathon in oh, seven okay. and a half hours. And I thought, Oh my God, you're right. And I signed up the next week <laughs> for Ultraman Canada. And I did it in 2011 and I was sixth overall. I was 20 minutes wow. from second place on a, on a 27 hour race. And I'm guessing and, those people have done it before. Oh yeah. Like a lot of them are, there's, there's a mix of rookies and veterans, but uh, yeah. I, I just was in love with my new oh. found. And I'd, in the meantime, I'd gotten a new coach and I'd learned how to run better. Cause I had, develop plantar fasciitis and heel spurs and all kinds mm-hmm. of crap from running poorly yeah. in the first few years. So I had a new coach and I had learned a lot of things. So now I, and I studied biomechanics and I became a, a coach myself to learn all of the bits and pieces so that I could run effectively, but it was phenomenal. And so then I got a spot for Ultraman world championships in 2013. Uh, I took a year off because my wife had our first son, which is our only son. But um, so we took a year off. And then after a year, she's like, you should get back to racing because you're really annoying. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, my wife can attest to that. If I don't run, if I'm not, if I'm not pushing myself physically, it, it, it shows. So, yeah. yeah, we need that outlet. Yes, exactly. You know, we need that outlet. We need to have that release um, mm. of stress, really. Cause yeah. I ran my own business and running a business is super, super stressful. And so, um, yeah, so I got back to it, went to the world championships in 2013 and that was great. Had a fantastic race. It was, um, I, I feel like I got slapped in the face with the reality of the difference between Ultraman Canada and Ultraman world championships, <laughs> very yeah. different race. And everybody there is really good mm-hmm. and it's open ocean swim, which oh, wow. is, you know, six mile open ocean swim, you leave the Kailua pier in Kona and you head just out to open water and it's two, 300 feet deep with jellyfish and sharks and all the things. And you, and there's the current is against you and it's salt water. So if you get a couple of mouthfuls, then you really get motion sick. And so, yeah, my first Ultraman worlds, uh, my swim was just under five hours and I threw up for three of them. So that's not a good place to be when you start the bike ride. Yeah. Uh, I got through it, had a good time. It was 21st in the world. So wow. that's pretty cool. That is fantastic. Yeah. And then the story takes a twist, um, which becomes, I think, part of the tie into a lot of what we could chat about, which is in yeah. 2015, I went back for the world championships again, and I had set my sights on being top five. I thought, you know what? I'm going to really go for it. And so I trained super crazy hard. For all of 2015, I had a, a, a really amazing coach and I was more fit than I've ever been. And I was ready. And we were filming a documentary about this average guy. Cause I don't like, I'm, I don't look like a triathlete genetically. Like when you see me in the start line, there's like 
the 140 pound guy, the 160 pound guy, the 150 pound guy, the 135 pound guy. And then me at 200, well, who, who brought that guy? Like, what's he doing here? Did you I win a long... lottery, sir? I mean, <laughs> yeah. like, how did you get here? Um, and I, and I, you know what I got there because I, I'm relentless. Like I never quit. And when I train, I train, I, I just never stop. Like I'm really good at suffering. <laughs> which, which is why childhood was great because it taught me how to suffer right it taught you me know, how to get to that's probably a, the, the most apt analogy for childhood uh you know for for most people is like you know it teaches you how to deal how to deal with suffering mm -hmm. so. yeah there's good in anything if mm -hmm. you look for it doesn't matter what it is there's there's good somewhere yep it's, it's a matter of seeing it or, or, or flipping the script on it and i mean that's the, that was a big thing. I, I still remember one of the times I came aware to that. I was at a course called Enlightened Warrior Training Camp, and um, I volunteered to the camp for about five years after I took it. But I remember one of the events was very, very physical, very, very challenging, and it was sort of it was taught by a multiple degree black belt in everything, and it was very a physical self defensey kind of a, a challenge. And you had to face an opponent and do a thing and be strong enough to withhold it, and I failed. I failed over and 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 over again. And if you failed badly enough, you you're actually unconscious. And so I was unconscious 20, 30 times in, oh. in the, in, and I just, so at the end of the course, and then you have to re reciprocate and challenge your partner and I could never um, get him to submit or whatever. And at the end of it, I was just sitting there thinking, feeling like an absolute failure. And I remember my partner sharing and at the end of the sharing circle, and he said, I want to acknowledge Scott. And I was like, what in the hell are you possibly acknowledging me for? I failed every time. Mm -hmm. And he was near to tears. And he said, he says, I've never seen anybody so determined. He got up every time I knocked him down and he looked me straight in the eyes and said, okay, let's do it again. Every time. And you never quit. I've never seen anybody so strong in my life. And I, my whole world came unglued. I thought, holy crap, I've been seeing this backwards. Every time I thought I was a failure, I, I didn't see the fact that I never quit. Yeah. And then eventually I would succeed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So to fast forward to 2015, got there and had a really phenomenal swim, had one of my best swims. And um, it was shortly over three hours. And I got on the bike and had a really strong day one. I was in 14th position and felt great. And got on day two and I was just hammering the bike and I was in 10th overall and I was hunting number nine and everything felt good. I felt strong. I only had uh, 90 kilometers left, which is whatever, 45, 50 miles left yep. and uh, 55 miles left. And it was raining a little bit. I was going down a bit of a, a mountainside. And apparently there was algae on the bridge deck. Mm. I don't remember that. I woke up yeah. three days later in the brain trauma unit on another island. Oh. And I had no memory of how I got there. And everything changed. Everything changed quickly. Yeah. I had um, I'd sprained some fingers. I sprained my wrist. I broke my left arm in half. I shattered my left shoulder. I broke five ribs. I busted up my knee. And I broke my skull open, exposing my brain. Um, oh, not a good idea. I had scraped the skin off the side of my face and because my helmet had twisted nearly off and I smashed my head on the concrete curb and it was, I was a mess. I kind of, <laughs> yeah, that yeah, was just, zero out of five on Yelp, you know, would not recommend. Yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. So you wake up and like you said, on a different Island, were you, I mean, and I'm sure people told you what had happened. Yeah. What was your mindset? when you started when you fully realized the extent of your injuries well that's a fun story because i didn't know the extent of my injuries but my first waking moments where i say the hard drive started recording again i woke up and my eyes focused and i looked across the hospital room and my best friend lyle is sitting in a chair and he kind of jumps up i'm like where the hell am i and and it, suddenly there's this whoosh of oh things hurt and I, because my first thought was like, I got to get back on the bike. And then I was like, I'm not on that anymore. And I realized, okay, I think something happened. And then, you know, Lyle said hi to me and I'm like, where am I? And he told me I was in the hospital in Oahu. 
And I was like, what happened? He says, well, you, you, you crashed your bike. I was like, okay. And I could just see the look in his eyes that it was pretty good that I wasn't dead. And so then he filled me in on the details and stuff. Now, the interesting thing is I found out later that that was about the fifth or sixth time we'd had that exact same conversation, <laughs> but this is the first time it stuck. Okay. It, it held. And it was interesting. The reason it held is because Lyle, who was my crew chief had actually lied to the nurses when they came in to give me more morphine or whatever they were giving me. He said, no, no, he's already got some. The other nurse already did that. And I started to come out of my, my induced coma or whatever I was in. And I started to remember. And he asked the doctor, he said, is it okay if I get him a, like a, a coffee drink or a, a nice drink or something? And so he got me a, you know, a venti, macchiato, hoopa, frupa, nupa, chini, chini, whatever, something. Oh, one of those. Yeah, something full of sugar yeah. and caffeine. And it yeah. kind of woke my brain up. And um. So that was pretty, that was something. And then my recovery kind of started. So I, I, they let me out of the hospital a couple of days later, Wow! but they didn't x-ray up my arm far enough to realize that my left radius was broken three pieces. They said oh. I, they had sprained my wrist, but they didn't know that my arm was broken. And they said my, my clavicle and my shoulder were broken, but they would heal. And there's no chance they would. Um, and they had put metal staples in to reconnect my skull bones and they said, when you get back home to Canada, then they can pull those out once you're, once the plate's healed and, and like that. So it's like, okay. So I thought, oh, right on, I'll get back to it. And they, we didn't even check my knee. We didn't know that there was a big chunk of cartilage and I had a torn MCL, but I just knew my knee was sore. I had a great big raspberry on it. We yeah. got back to Canada. I went to see my doctor and I was like, man, it is stuff. It really hurts. Like I know they said it was a sprained wrist and whatever. And they said my shoulder would heal, but you know, it was this big lopsided thing. And I was like, this doesn't feel very good. And I'm a personal trainer. Like I couldn't, couldn't supinate or pronate my arm without pain. And so we went and got x-rays <laughs> and the x-ray tech was like, oh man, you got to go straight to surgery. Like, I don't know how they let you out of the hospital. So I went to, uh, went to emergency and saw Dr. Gazelli and uh, Dr. Gazelli was like, holy crap, we got to get you in surgery like now. So they, they put me in a room and then uh, the next day I had had a five hour surgery to rebuild my shoulder. It was in four pieces and oh. um, they had to put a plate in my arm and reattach the pieces. And, um, and then they, but they, the biggest concern was the brain injury. Uh, they, she was really, really worried about brain injury and I had knocked all the crystals free in my head. So my, I was dizzy like crazy all the time. So they had to do the epilepsy maneuver to get the crystals back in my ears for balance. And um, I had whiplash and I had, you know, they, they just started diagnosing all the problems. So I had a CT scan and then a deep level MRI and another MRI and met with a neurologist and they did all these different things to assess. And they, they said, you've got, you know, the worst brain injury you can get you have diffuse axonal scarring, which is where the white matter and the gray matter have hit so hard. They've torn apart in oh. your brain. And, um, I had hemorrhaging bleeding to the frontal lobes and I had a point impact at the base where, um, where I had hit the curb and where I broke my skull open. So. Um, they were really concerned about the brain injury. So that was, that was the thing. Um, yeah, they, yeah, a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. And I knew like I got, I slept a lot and if I stayed awake too long, I would slur my words and I couldn't really walk and it sucked. <laughs> yeah. um, but I did hyperbaric oxygen therapy treatments for about oh, three Oh, I love that. Best naps. Yeah. I did. I did HBOT for five days a week for three okay. months. Yeah. It changed everything. Yeah. For those of you that don't know out there, hyperbaric oxygen therapy, you lay in a glass cylinder and they close the door and they pressurize it to one atmosphere. So 33 feet below sea level. And then you can breathe pure oxygen for an hour and your body just heals really fast. It, when I had it, I had, they had this huge room. It was about the size of a bus. And you put on this helmet, this plastic helmet that makes you look like a B rated version of, of Mr. Freeze. Yeah from, yeah. The bat, from Batman. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you're just breathing that pure oxygen in. And they gave me two minute, two stints of 45 minutes with a five minute break. Right. And oh yeah, it is the good stuff. Yeah. It's something else. Like it's yeah, it's not inexpensive. Um, it cost oh, us no. all of our savings, but who cares? My brain worked. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then I had to do neurology training and I had to do all the things where you follow the lighted pencil and, or the lighted pen. And you had to, I had to do strokes charts where there's a bunch of words on a, on a chart on the wall. And it says yellow, blue, green, pink, 
black, white, but they're not the colors they say. Yeah. It says yellow, but it's green. And it says blue, but it's red. And so depending on the, the mood of the therapist, I had to either say the word or the color. Oh, and it was man. timed. How many words can you get through in 30 seconds in a minute? And man, alive, when I first started, I could do five words a minute. It was awful. Like you're just mm. staring at the word and it just, the synapses aren't, wires aren't connecting. Yeah. Um, but I went, I got through a lot of that stuff and I tripped a lot when I ran. Anyway, it was, it was a thing. Mm. It was a thing. <laughs> yeah. And so, so again, this was in 2015, correct? That the 20, accident 2015. Happened. That's right. 2015. Yeah. yeah. All right. And so at what point do you realize, okay, it's, I'm not going to be like this forever. There, there is a, you know, there is an escalation of improvement going on. Mm. I don't know if I would call it an escalation or is a worm's pace nudge, but yes, okay. there was, but I was clear. I, there's a recording of me in the hospital in Oahu saying, I'm a little banged up, but I'll get back to the race. I'll be racing again. Give me a few weeks kind of thing. And I never... I never wavered on that. That was never a thing that I wavered on, negotiated on. I was always clear. I was getting back to racing. I just didn't know how or when or, I, but I was getting back to racing. That was non-negotiable. Yeah, and yeah. that was my, one of the things I always like to say when you're, when you've got a goal or you're struggling or, or anything like that is I, I like to say that jo joining a race or signing up for some, nearly impossible thing is like throwing a boat anchor into the future with a rubber band on it. And it pulls you to that goal. Yeah. And it, it just, it gets you there because I needed that to stay sane. I needed something to, to, to fight for and to go towards. And it was a really long, challenging uh, journey. Oh yeah. To, and, and, to get and, there. Yeah. And I totally can, uh, empathize with that because when I was in the hospital with my ordeal, I ordered myself a new pair of running shoes Yeah, in the hospital to get that motivation going. And, and it totally worked because 10 minutes after the uh, home therapy nurse left the last time I put those shoes on and I went running. Yeah. Albeit it was my worst mile ever, but still I, I had to get back on that horse. Like you said. Yeah. I still remember a lot of the memories in, in early 2016 are really sketchy, but I remember quite clearly my wife was beside me and my, my orthopedic surgeon had explained all the surgeries she'd done. This was the night. So they, they finally got a spot for me in surgery. I think it was seven or 8 PM. And I, and they wheeled me out at just about 1 AM. So she worked on me for a good long time to put everything yeah. back together. And she explained what she'd done. She said, do you have any questions? And I said, yeah, when can I start training again? <laughs> She just looked at me like, I just rebuilt you. Like, what do you mean? And I said, well, I'm a triathlete. When can I swim again? She's like, Oof, you're going to be four, five, six months before we can take that metal out of your shoulder. Um, so you, and, and you're going to have to do some therapy before you'll have any range of motion back in your shoulder. So that's going to be a while. And I said, what about biking, cycling? She says, you won't be able to hang onto a bike for a while. Um, you could do a stationary bike maybe in a while, a couple months. And I said, what about running? She's like, well, you know, you could probably start running again, like in a month. I'm like, so 30 days and I can run. And she, she just kind of laughs. And she What's goes, the first race? Yeah, I know. Right. So <laughs> she's like, you can give it a try. So, uh, so I literally have photos of me on day 30 and I went for a run. I Velcroed my arm to my chest and, and let's be honest, it wasn't a run. It was a shuffle. Like I, oh yeah. Yeah. I, I shuffled for a yeah, I shuffled for a minute and I walked for a minute and I shuffled for a minute and I walked for a minute. I did that for 12 minutes yeah. and I called it. Uh, but what was really fascinating was that first run. It might have been 20 minutes. Anyway, that after that first run, my mental cognition took a leap up. Mm -hmm. Like it, it was, it was it went from a gradual improvement, it, it ratcheted up like a notch. Yeah. And I went home and I, this is, a, this is kind of graphic, but maybe you'll know this. I peed a black, disgusting, anesthesia smelling yuck that the run had jostled free, reintroduced through peristalsis or whatever. I processed through a bunch of the anesthesia and we're talking 30 days post-op. So, yeah. and once that was out, 
I could stay awake longer. I had stopped all my pain meds, which apparently you're not supposed to stop opioids suddenly, but I did because I hated those things. I just stopped all meds. <laughs> yeah, we were get talking again. I have a, a little bit, a little story about not going cold turkey. Mm. You should not do that. Yeah, um, I did. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, I, I just did. Uh, yeah. Anyway, um, yeah, I remember the doctor saying, well, wasn't that awful? I'm like, oh, yeah, it was three days of hell, but it's gone now. I'm fine. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, um, it was quite a journey. And physiotherapy to get my shoulder back running again was, was hard. Um, you know, it was big, long sessions of my physiotherapist putting his hand on my elbow and his hand on my rib cage and pushing, up, pushing them apart as far as he could. Because I had a frozen shoulder, right? Because the, the metal plate that they put hooked onto the acromion process and I couldn't lift my arm more than 40 degrees because it would hit the metal. And so once they pulled that out seven months later, my, all the ligaments had shortened and my shoulder oh, wow. was stuck there. So yeah. that was a long process. I'm happy now. I've, I'm, I'm full hundred range, hundred percent range of motion. Again, I can nice. do pull-ups and all that stuff. So that was a long process. And then there was two really hard things that happened in 2017, getting ready for Ironman Coeur d'Alene, my comeback race to prove that I had the endurance to apply, to go back to the world championships I was at a course in the States and we were playing a game where you, the speaker on the stage throws hollow Easter eggs with money in them out into the crowd and you dive to get them. And I jumped to get one and this big guy dove at the same time and he crashed into me and my knee folded backwards and sideways where it shouldn't go. And it tore the MCL, MCL. And we realized that the MCL and the cartilage from the tear and the crash had actually formed a fibrous bridge and had healed as one piece. And when that happened, it tore them free again. And the doctor said, I kind of saved myself a surgery, but I actually revealed that we got to go in there and clean this up. Yes. So then I had surgery in June, late June, early July of 2017, five weeks before Ironman Coeur Okay. All right. So, but, but the important question is, yeah. did you get the egg? I did not get the egg. Oh, I did not get the egg. Oh, that turkey man. got it. <laughs> oh. I think it was like five bucks or something. Like who cares? Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. So That's that an was egg to lose. Right. Yeah. That was hiccup number one. <laughs> and so we got knee surgery and I got through Ironman Coeur d'Alene, um, which was a hard race for a lot of reasons, but not the least of which is I had ballooned up to 227 pounds. Mm. Like I was, cause all the inactivity and yeah. I wasn't eating great, all that kind of stuff. Uh, but I got the check mark. I had to be under 14 hours to be the bare minimum to apply and I was 1357 or something. I had like three minutes that spare. So it, it was tight, but I made yeah. it. And uh, so then great check mark. So I applied in 2018 and we were filming the whole time, filming the recovery and all that kind of stuff. And in 2018, I went to Arizona triathlon training camp with my coach and we were having a great session. I was feeling better and better and better and stronger and stronger and had more range of motion in my shoulder. So I could swim a little bit better. I could almost breathe on the one side and everything was going pretty good. It was the last day and we were running down the mountainside and I was still having cognition problems, like where there was a delay from where my foot was to when my brain knew that's where it was mm. We're only talking maybe a couple hundredths of a second, but it meant I tripped a lot. Yep. And this particular time I caught a toe and tripped in a bunch of rocks and I, where I put my hands down, I folded six fingers backwards. I dislocated and gloved Ooh. this one down to the bone and I folded that one backwards. So that was really disheartening. <laughs> yeah. Cause I was finally getting on track and things were going well uh, to this day. I still can't close that hand all the way um, okay. where it was damaged. I, I get therapy every week. We're getting closer, but uh, that was really hard. But the big piece about that was I started asking, okay, why did I trip? Like what's going on? Like, I know there's the brain damage bit, whatever, but yeah. why did I trip and why did I crash in 2015? And how come every time I'm in a race or in my business or in anything I do where I'm just about to, everything's going to be great. And then it's not because mm. that happens so many times, so many times I could tell you race story after race story after race story where I was on the verge of success and then something pulled the rug out from under me. And it's like, what is going on? And I started asking deeper questions and I, Talked to a friend of mine 
Anaki de la Pera, who won Ultraman World Championships uh, in one of the years while I was out. And I reached out to him because I had raced with Anaki and he was a good athlete, but the fact that he won the world championships was pretty surprising. Mm-hmm. And I was like, what did you do? How did you get there? And he said, oh, I started seeing Inga Jorklausen, who does vegetative training out of Germany. And I was like, okay, can I connect with him? So I connect with him. And I found out that another athlete, Jeremy Howard, had used him. And so I connected with, uh, with, with he used to call himself Inga Jorklausen. Now it's Jarl Klausen. So anyway, when I talked talk to Jarl, and we started doing some Zoom therapy sessions on breathing techniques and kind of thinking about the bigger reasons why we do the things we do. Mm-hmm. And at some point in May, he's like, yeah, you have to come to Germany. I can't help you anymore from here. You have to come to Germany. So I was like, uh, come to Germany. Um, okay. So I talked to my wife and you know what? We just found a way and I went to Germany and I spent a week. Awesome. And he got my ribs working again because I had so much scar tissue in them. And we did some really deep breathing processing techniques. And we processed a lot of the mental scar tissue about why I was crashing. and Why was I hurting myself? And why was racing akin to punishment instead of celebration? Mm. It was really fascinating. And we had that to ask really some questions. Yeah. yeah, really deep. And... It was interesting as we were talking, he said to me at one point, he goes, I have to stop now. And I'm like, what? what do you mean? He says, I won't do the accent. He says, if we dig any deeper, you'll quit racing. You'll never do it again. It's like, what do you mean? He says, well, you love nothing left to prove. And cause he had gotten to the point that, so when I was born, my mom was 17 and she gave me up for adoption. And so I went into the adoption part of the world and I had a hiatus hernia. So I was not fit for adoption. So I was in the hospital for six months waiting for my hernia to be dealt with before I could be adopted. So for the first six months of my life, I had abandonment syndrome, right? Which is a a wiring in the brain situation because the only way you can get attention is to scream until you're in pain. And then the nurse comes. I'm sure the nurses were wonderful, lovely people, but they're busy. They have other things to do. Not like when you're with your mom and she just cuddles you the whole time. So that becomes a formative part of how your brain wires. And then I ended up adopted into a family, wonderful family, and had their own challenges. And that created the next level of me not thinking I was worthy, not good enough. So then in my adult life, every time I was about to succeed, there was a misalignment where my subconscious would say, no, 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 no you can't be successful. You're a loser because I identified with being a loser. You're a failure. You can't be successful. You have to be a failure. That's who we are. And so my subconscious mind would create a situation to continue that to be true. Really quick. And maybe I'm just, you know, spitballing here. Do you think that mental misalignment is what led to your accident on the vault? Yes. hundred percent. It was to get attention. Okay. Yeah. Wow. It's that subconscious mind trying to get attention from your parents who are drunk and don't care. Hmm. Yeah. It, it's, it's a hundred percent kids. Kids do that. Um, it's, uh, it's sad, but it's kids just want attention. They don't, your, your subconscious mind doesn't think about how you're getting attention. It just wants attention. Yeah. It's um, yeah. I don't know. It is what it is. Okay. So that, that, <laughs> but, that, that, I, I, I'm just, I'm a little proud of myself that I made that connection anyway. Yeah, uh, that's so, good. That's, that's really huge. You did because that's exactly the same thing. So I'll tell you another story about that time frame. So I broke my back in high school. Mm-hmm. Um, and if you, you back up six months earlier, I had gotten into three meter, 10 foot springboard diving. All right. And so I was on a dive team and I made it to the provincial, the state championships. And I won a gold medal Wow! in three meter springboard diving. And I got home. I got off the bus and my friends, uh, parents gave me a ride home. And I I walked into the house. It was about one o'clock in the morning. And my dad stumbled out of the bedroom and said, "Um, I heard you did okay. And I said, yeah. And he kind of went, hmm. And then that was, nobody ever talked about it again. Huh. And so I put my gold medal in a toffee fate chocolate box and I shoved it under the bed and I never talked about it. I never talked about it again for 20 years. Oh my goodness. 
and, 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 and a month after that, I broke my back hmm. because as a kid, you're like, I got a gold medal. They're going to notice now they're going to be so yeah. proud of me. I can picture what they're going to say. And then they're like, nothing. Oh, well, maybe if I get really hurt, then they'll notice. Yeah. That's where your kid brain goes. Wow. And it's crazy. So and folks, we, if you learn nothing else from Scott, praise your kids. If they do yes. something good, give them the acknowledgement that they need, not just want, they need. Ah. All right. So going back to your, uh, your German therapist, which by the way, I must commend you, your German accent is much better than your Australian. <laughs> so you get to the point where he says, if he goes any farther, you're going to not want to race go from there please so it was really cool when he did that in a sense because i switched to racing because i love to race not because i'm trying to prove anything and i've definitely noticed a huge difference in my drive now i train because i feel like it or don't and i enjoy it and i still race but way less and it's for the joy of it mm -hmm. it's it's completely different and i can really i get what he says i no longer have the pressure to race it's not a have to anymore it's a oh, if i feel like i think i will and because i enjoy it yeah it's different it's really shifted it's really shifted and the need to arm myself or punish myself or fail is just gone. And what that became really interesting. So we went back in 2018 and it was super fun. I had a blast. Uh, it was a really tough course that year because the lava flow in Kona meant we couldn't take the usual course. So we had to go up and over Saddle Mountain Road, oh, which those is volcanoes causing problems. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You know, um, yeah. nature, what are you going to do? Yeah, I know. Um, stop the lava flow, please. We're trying to have a race. I know. Right. So, yeah, so I, but I made it and it was interesting because in the world championships, they only invite 40 people in the world. You have to qualify to get in. They only choose 40 people to race mm. and 14 people didn't make the bike cutoff on day two because it was, it was the equivalent of halfway up Everest. It was almost 14,000 feet of climbing. Oh, wow. Yeah. It was a snotty, difficult, hot, you know, challenging race. Um, yeah. But I finished 25th in the world again, which is good. And just had a blast, had a joyful, peaceful, amazing time the whole time. And what was interesting too, is after Inga had worked with me, um, I don't get motion sick anymore. Oh, really? Yeah. Wow. Because yeah, I, I would couldn't... think that would be more physiolog uh, physiological than psychological. He, they're, somehow they're tied together. Hmm. I don't know what that is, but I did not throw up in the 2018 open ocean swim. And a week later, my wife and I went scuba diving. I didn't have any medication and I didn't get sick on the boat. I didn't get sick while I was diving. And we went on a helicopter ride and I forgot my gravel at home. Mm -hmm. And we went on a helicopter ride and I did not get motion sick. And that's not, that's, that's unheard of in my life. <laughs> wow. So that was fascinating too. Um, phenomenal, phenomenal stuff. And vegetative training is all about just breathing like proper deep breathing and posture so that your parasympathetic response wakes up and your, your vagus nerve system, the, the nerves all in the back relax instead of being in sympathetic, which is fight or flight, resist, deal, pun it. Like, like instead of being that all the time, it's that sort of Zen, like it's all good. <laughs> so it's switching, <laughs> switching energies. It made a huge, huge difference. Wow. So where has this uh, brought you to today? So many gifts from it. Um, in 2020, in, on March 17th, we were told in our province, in our state, uh, here in Canada, Alberta, we were told to shut down all gyms, mm. uh, along with everything else in, in that whole whatever. And so I shut down my gym. And at first, I was going to fight. I'm like, okay, we'll do online videos. We'll do online courses. We'll do a 12-week at-home Get Fit program. We'll do all these things. And right away, I was like, Scotty, what are you doing? What are, you, what are you doing? You're, this isn't a battle you can win. You can't bully through this. I knew it wasn't 14 days to flatten anything. We gave the politicians the keys to the Ferrari and said, just take it around the block. Yeah, okay. Um, so 
I knew this was, I thought it was going to be three months. <laughs> Oops. Yeah. Um, but I looked at the numbers because I had stopped all billing, um, paid off all my staff. And I looked at the numbers and to have a 15,000 square foot building empty for three months, I, the, I had no cash reserves to pay rent on even, even if the bank would freeze the rent, the, the gas and electric companies aren't freezing anything. Like it just, even empty, it was $15,000 a month. We're oh, dead. Wow. We're dead. There's no chance yeah. we're, we're surviving this. Even if the, the 12 week at home program is unicorn fairy dust successful, we fail and I lose my house. So we, I made the decision within 48 hours to, to stop and to stop the fight and just pull back. And I sold off all my equipment, paid off all our debts, paid off all of our members who had pre-purchased the year membership. We gave them either money back or come and get some equipment and take it home. Mm -hmm. And we cleared everything off and we found a church to rent our building. And after 18 years, I, I, I walked away and it was, it was hard. It was emotional. I, a wow. lot of my staff were my best friends and, and had some, it was, it was tough. I ugly bowled a lot, but I knew it was the right decision. And it's, been honestly a miracle because I'm home all the time. I have an amazing young boy who's turning 10 this year and he's got autism and ADHD and I'm home all the time now. I'm daddy's not working all the time. And because there were times where I didn't see him for four days because I was gone to work before he was up and I was home after he was asleep. And that's tough. You know, I'd go kiss his cheek while he's sleeping, but that's not the deal. And yeah. always working, always working. So that's different now. I'm home all the time. And I had a bunch of time to go, okay, well, what do you want to do with your life? If you don't own a gym? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> so I looked at what do I love to do? What am I good at it? Well, I love fitness and nutrition. I love to coach and I love to be a keynote speaker. And so I built this podcast studio up above the stairs in our storage room. We think, oh, it's a big, beautiful room. It's seven feet by seven feet by seven feet. I can touch all the walls from sitting. So, oh yeah, it, yeah, it's it's same. Well, I have a little more room here, but I know it looks really pristine and clear. There, there are piles and things strewn all around me, and no one yeah. would know. It does the trick, yeah. right? Yeah, exactly. It, it does the trick. So I built this, and I started doing. Um, I do a twenty-one day nutrition reset. So to just clear off and restart with all real foods, whole foods. You don't have to measure calories. It's a phenomenal, phenomenal. It's my, my favorite thing. I have a, I built a 90 page manual and I, I coach 30 to 50 people a month and it's phenomenal. And I just, I'm in love with what I get to do. I've got people that have dropped 75 pounds, 35 pounds, 40 pounds, 50 pounds. And they're just, their whole life is different. And I get to make, so I make daily mindset videos to coach on not only nutrition, but the psychology of nutrition and, and how to get through social situations and why this matters and how this works. And I get to coach and I just, I love what I get to do. And it's a dream. Like it's phenomenal. That is, that is the dream being able to do what you want to do. So it doesn't feel like work. Yeah. It, I mean, it, it's still work. Like it's still it still takes time every day and I still have oh, yeah. to put a lot of energy into it, but it's different. It's not a have to, it's a want yes. to or a get yeah, to. Yeah, get to. Yeah, it's yeah. huge. Yeah. And, and our film, um, Living the Warrior Code, the documentary, we've won a bunch of awards, including Audience Choice. And so it's, thank you. It's free on YouTube at warriorcodefilm.com. It's um, 82 minutes, family friendly. You can play it in your school. There's those profanity. It's, there's one scene where there's, me getting hauled in an ambulance and there's a pool of blood that's like six feet in diameter and some stuff but other than that it's it's um it's family friendly we've had six-year-olds watch it and be okay um nice. and so and i'm writing the book to follow up to that i'm about i don't know sixty thousand words into that book and i've got a Ooh. publishing group i'm working with so should have that out by summer um to fill in all the blanks that the movie couldn't cover and mm -hmm. it's just super exciting like i it's just uh, you know i got a lot of scars but it's exciting. I wanted to show you one of my scars because yeah. we're all about scars, right? So, yeah, this one, so. I, when I went back to Hawaii to the, to the world championships, yeah. I got, I'm a big Lilo and Stitch because I love Stitch, right? Yeah. Oh, Hannah means family and family oh. means nobody gets left behind or forgotten, right? Your Stitch, okay, your Stitch better than your German. <laughs> Wait till you hear my Kermit the Frog. But yeah. so I had Stitch done and he's hanging on to my scar. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. He's hanging on to my shoulder scar. That's pretty sweet. Yeah. Great, good use. Yeah. I got a big head scar, but I don't think I get enough street credit for a tattoo there, but uh, yeah. I don't know how well you can see it, but I'll try. All right. 
Okay. Hey, well, it's commendable. Yeah. 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 The big little spot where my brain's all leaked out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you should you should put like a faucet there. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. So yeah. so Scott, where can people find you if they're looking for that 21 day reset or they want to learn more about your story other than the vi- the video? Yeah, sure. I'm scottyfit.com. So S-C-O-T-T-Y-F-I-T.com. So scottyfit.com is an easy way to, to find me. Uh, my website guy and are still working on making sure the contact form works, but I'm pretty available on social media. You can find me on Instagram and Facebook under Scotty Fit. So um, those are kind of the usual things. I'm on LinkedIn, stuff like that. Excellent. Yeah. And we've talked about this a lot, but what is one aspect of your journey that looking back at it, at the time it happened, you would have thought that you would could ever appreciate it, but now you are very grateful for it. Mm. You know, that's a great question and so much of it, but I think really what a gift it is to be alive. Because as you know, in a split second, everything changes. Yeah. Like, like, I mean, you scratch your arm on a, on the wall in the garage. Like I've done that a hundred times, like, you know, and all of a sudden they're using words that are not calming. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Necrotizing <laughs> never been known to calm you down. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And yeah, like that was, there's a picture that it took me a long time to look at without crying. It still wells me up, but it's, it's me in the hospital in Oahu and my three-year-old looking at me Mm. and the whole side of my head is just blood and bandages and patches and um my shoulders in a sling and my knees all covered in scabs and and he's just looking at me with this beautiful innocence and he just i'm his dad and he loves me and i was like wow i almost lost that Mm -hmm. and i think when 2020 happened and they shut down my gym it was an easy decision I'm done with this. Mm-hmm. I'm done. I'm going to go spend more time with my son. Mm-hmm. I'm going to be home for my wife. This is easy. Hard, but easy. Because yeah. life is so amazing and life is so valuable. And it could end suddenly without warning. And it's worthy of just doing the things you love that matter. You don't have to suffer. Cause my job had become suffering. I loved my gym for a long time, but in the later couple of years of running my gym, it was me working like a rented stepchild and not getting paid. Like it was just stupid. Yeah. Okay. Can't, yeah. No, it's no time for stupid. <laughs> nope. Nope. There, there's very little time. If, if zero time for stupid, you're, I agree. Yeah. 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 That's awesome. Well, you know, it's been a pleasure to talk with you, Scott, but I do have one more question. Yeah. What is your favorite dinosaur? Oh, my favorite dinosaur. I mean, T-Rex is so obvious and so easy. I'm a big fan of Velociraptors. That's pretty cool. Triceratops when I was a kid. Yeah. But I, I mean, T-Rex is a big, impressive. He's still, T-Rex still pretty cool. Yeah, it, it is. And, and uh, you know, if you watch the uh, videos preceding this, uh, I've had, I think the last four guests have all said t-rex and they all get give different reasons like yeah. cognitive function pack mentality making up for the arms so yeah, yeah it's yeah he's yeah he, he, he i mean there's a lot going on there oh yeah like as a gym yeah. owner we always had we had t-shirts t-rex hates push-ups you know it, it's yeah. just fun, right so there's so much about it my son just loves dinosaurs obviously because he's a 10 year old boy yeah well but yeah well, so. I do too. I even have a Transformer. I love Transformers and Grim- Grimlock is one of my favorites. So my son has a Grimlock. <laughs> yeah, awesome. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, Sc- well, Scott, I can definitely say this is one of my most enjoyable uh, interviews. I, you know, I felt like it was more of a conversation. It's great to get to know you on a deeper level. Thank you so much for sharing your story with me. I greatly appreciate it. You are very welcome. I hope that uh, people out there enjoy it and scars are just stories exactly yeah i I definitely agree and we both have a lot of them a lot of stories to share that's right yeah Yeah. so folks if you want to reach out to scott just to say hi or to connect with him about him being your coach you can look in the show notes below to find out where you can get that information if you want to reach out to me 
to find out how the attitude of gratitude can help you develop that greater sense of gratitude, positivity, and resilience, please go to chrisdtgordon.com. And with that, I thank you so much for hanging out with us today. Please have a great day. And remember to pass on perfection and go for greatness. Greatness.